Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Digital Making at Home live stream. If you haven't already, say hello to us in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm Mr. C, coming to you live from Cambridge in the UK. And back once again is the sparkling Christina. How are you, Christina? Sparkling. You always have such great adjectives. Hi, Mr. C. It's so good to see you. How are you doing today? Yeah, really good. Thank you. I'm, I'm on a mission to have a new adjective every time you come on, by the way. It's the thing that I'm trying to do. I love this mission. I love it so much. And hello to everyone. I'm joining from Nebraska in the United States. And thank you to everyone who jo who is joining us from your homes all over the world. Today is going to be great. And you know what, Mr. C, it's funny because normally at this point in the show, we'd be talking about some tech news. But this week is special, like super special because we made some of our own tech news. And we've actually got Evan Upton here, one of the founders of the Raspberry Pi to code with us on the brand new just released shiny, exciting Raspberry Pi Pico. Absolutely, I'm very excited to play with the Pico. It was only launched last week and it is such a cool gadget. Like we're going to talk with Eben today about what Raspberry Pi Pico is, how it's different from a regular Raspberry Pi computer, and then we're gonna do some coding with it. Yes, maybe we'll try out some analog inputs, something that's new to the Raspberry Pi family and a really useful feature. It also, we're, it runs MicroPython, which is what we'll be coding in today. So you can see the starter project at raspberrypi.pico, or sorry, raspberrypi.o slash pico dash go. Check this out, it's a great starter project. And if those terms don't sound familiar, that's okay. We're gonna be, this is an introduction to Pico. We're gonna be going through those together today. And we already have lots of folks in the chat. I can see you, it's so great. And we also had folks in the chat early, so special shout out to Larry, Apron, Coding for Kids in Iraq. Great to see you getting involved already. Welcome, we're so excited to have you in the conversation. Please keep letting us know where you're joining us from. Absolutely, and for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to Digital Making at Home. It's all about getting young people just like you, coding and creating things with technology. Every week we chat with cool people like Eben, we code together and we see amazing digital making projects from all over the world. We're broadcasting live right now to YouTube, Facebook, Twitch and Twitter and that's every Wednesday. We can see your comments in the chat on all those platforms and we do want to hear from you. So feel free to ask us questions, make suggestions or just make your opinion known in the chat. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe as well or head to rpf.io slash sub to get all of our content as it comes out. Yes, subscribe, sus subscribe. You may be thinking, hey, I thought I was already subscribed to the Raspberry Pi's YouTube channel. Well, this is our new channel, which focuses on kids and the educational work that we do. You'll find great tutorials for young people here and all the product news on our other channels as always. So special shout out to Martin, Andre and Ellie, some of our newest subscribers. Thanks for being part of the Raspberry Pi community. Absolutely. All Should right, so yes, let's bring on Evan. Absolutely, Evan, are you there? Where is he? Is he somewhere? Oh, I'm here. Is he coming? Is he coming? Hey, oh, hey. He's here, he's here, he did it. That was good. Hello. That was a magic trick. How's it going? How, how are you, Skipper? Everything good? Yeah, it's good. It's been an incredible few days, right? Um, yeah. Um, hey, congratulations. Big yeah, congratulations. Definitely. Every week at the moment. But yeah, no, it's, it's been great. It's been really, really good. to Because we already, the nice thing is we're already starting to see people, this is the bit kind of five, six days after launch, where you start to see people really using the stuff you've made. Uh, and that's, so that's been a great couple of days. Yeah, there's been some cool ones. I saw some really nice projects coming up on the internet lately. So the one I really liked was a home security system powered by Pico. I saw somebody do that with the Pi camera, a bunch of other cool stuff. Amazing. Yeah, it's pretty advanced, right? I mean, that's yeah. kind of, that's a little bit beyond what we were expecting in the first week. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's brand new for Raspberry Pi 2, the Pico. Like, if you had to explain to our audience, who remember are like 10-year-old kids and things, how would you describe the Pico to them? Okay, well, Raspberry Pi is... a Raspberry Pi, regular Raspberry Pi, a big Raspberry Pi, is a computer, it's a PC. Um, it does everything a PC does. Um, it does all the good things PCs do, like surfing the web and running C compilers and, and things, but it also has some of the, the downsides of, of a PC. So in particular, <laughs> Even at its lowest power, it consumes quite a lot of power. So it can consume maybe a watt of power, at least. And that means if you're running off batteries, you need a big battery if you want to use it for a long time. Um, another thing about the big Raspberry Pi is that it um, only has digital I.O. So it can only it only thinks about ones and zeros when it's interfacing with the world, um, where sometimes it's nice, as we'll find out fairly soon, uh, to be able to uh, interact with the world in a more analog way, because the world is really analog. And so what, what's, what Raspberry Pi Pico is, it's a microcontroller board. It consumes much less. It can do less. 
uh, but it consumes much less power. And it has a few of these things, interfacing capabilities that make it better suited to some of the kind of bits of digital making that mm -hmm. traditionally Raspberry Pi hasn't reached yet. Very cool. Yeah, I love it. I've got one. It's like right here. I'll show you. I've got my one here. Just for the size comparison, here's one. And here's, the actual, okay. <laughs> here's the actual beast, the original Pi, the, or the Pi 3 here. So you can see the difference in size, everybody. They're quite, quite different. You can see that they're much smaller form factor here for embedding and all sorts of cool stuff. All right, we'll get on to that in just a little while. The cool thing was that someone just all put a picture on Twitter the other day of it next to a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is kind of the small, the little, the little big pie, the smallest of the big pies. Um, and while we always think of Zero as being this tiny little thing and it just towers over Pico, it's just it's a bit longer and wider and taller. Uh, and Pico's just sat there next to it. So it's kind of cool to make small things. And of course, one of the wonderful things about the Pico program is that the chip. What's the coolest thing about Pico? We made the chip on Pico. So, so for the first time, this is a Raspberry Pi. There you, are. you can see the little logo, our logo on top Fancy. of the chip. Fancy! Yeah. Yeah, nice. And that opened up this new world to us. And in particular, what it lets us do is take that chip and give it to partners like Adafruit and SparkFun and Pimarani and, and Arduino, um, who are going to build chips, are going to build boards based on the chip. And some of those boards are even tinier. Um, I think Adafruit wow. and ArcFun both have these tiny, they're barely bigger than the chip itself and have very few pins on. But if you've got to squeeze it into a small space that you could never fit a big Raspberry Pi into, then that's that's going to be awesome. That's really incredible. And there's just a lot of excitement in the chat with folks from the UK, Denmark, Puerto Rico. Hello, Alex. <laughs> and <laughs> Brazil, Nigeria. There's also someone in Peru who's saying like they're waiting for their Pico to arrive. Lots of excitement just around the world for this. Yeah, very cool. I mean, it's such a really cool design. And like you were saying that you designed the chip, right? Your team designed the chip. That's right. So, we, so the team here at Raspberry Pi Trading um uh designed um the the chip from scratch i um, mean these are people who've been i mean this is this was this was this important of emphasis wasn't me um that we we have people here who've been designing chips their entire lifetime their entire lives we have people here who uh probably 40 years i think probably the longest that anyone here has been designing chips is 40 years and you think that's all the way back you think what, was, what the world was like 40 years ago you're talking a world where the bbc micro um launched 40 years ago so that kind of like quintessential uh british 8-bit microcomputers 40 years old so you have people whose experience of this goes all the way back to that time when you could really only fit a very few transistors uh, on the chip um and I spent time working on it it's a beautiful design i mean it's a really 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 polished design and it reflects people who are really at the top of their game working on it for a long time and being given the kind of freedom we try to try to give them the freedom to to do their best work yeah, that's incredible. I don't, for, for most of the people who are watching, and for me as well, like to be perfectly honest, designing a chip, the thing that goes on inside the chips is almost like magic, right? It's like voodoo. That was how my you, question. <laughs> how, do you, how do you begin designing a chip? Like where do you start designing a chip for logic? Like, well, well, it's interesting, right? Because it's all built up, like, like everything in computing, it's all built up from very, very simple bits. And the, the simple bits are like, literally bits. Um, and the the they are... They're very un understandable. Like the, the, some, somehow, it always feels like both ends of computing to me are kind of understandable. So you have logic gates down the bottom end. So you have, you know, an OR gate, a two input OR gate. So you've got uh, a, a little logic a, a box, a black box, uh, and you have two inputs into it. And if either one of those is a one, which is usually represented as a high voltage, as opposed to zero voltage, um, then the output is a one. And if they're both low, if it's then the output's low. And so it corresponds to your idea of what or means. Is, is this true or this true? Oh, one of them is, then the statement, this or that is true. If neither of them are true, then the statement is false. Um, and so these things, they correspond to very natural kind of Boolean logic, corresponds to very natural things that we say in our everyday language. And so that's very, very comprehensible. And really what chips are built out of is little silicon instantiations of those gates. Um, and then at the other end, you kind of understand what your, your computer's doing. You, can use the desktop environment on your computer. And it's just that kind of trying, and a lot of what I know, a lot of what you guys do, a lot of what we've tried, what we wanted to do when we founded the Raspberry Pi Foundation was to give people, it doesn't have to be incredibly detailed, but some kind of understanding of what all of those steps are between those two very comprehensible ends. Um, there's a course, I think there's a course called Nanta Tetris, which is kind of out there somewhere that tries to teach you a little bit of all of the 
all of the steps between a NAND gate, which is another sort of logic gate, um, and a game of Tetris. And at the end of it, you kind of supposed to be there playing Tetris. And you have, you don't know in detail, but you have some idea of what all of those stacks are. It's all about abstraction. You know, the thing that makes computing doable is abstraction. So that so you don't need to understand the detail of everything that's going on. We don't on. have to speak in ones and zeros, right? We have all well, we those different layers zero. of translation from us to Python to the machine. That's yeah, it. very cool. It's, it's still good to, but yeah, the, it's, abstraction is a strength and a weakness. So it's a strength because it lets you, it lets me sit down and write a JavaScript program um, uh, in, in to run in a web browser uh, without worrying about what the logic gates are doing. But it's also a weakness because it can kind of, you can end up with a very hollow understanding, a very shallow, hollow understanding of the environment you're, you're, you're programming in. And that's why I think, you know, that kind of, the nan to Tetris, the layered thing, just give everyone a little bit of understanding. And it helps you do a better, whatever layer of abstraction. We have people here at Raspberry Pi who are doing engineering at all sorts of different layers of abstraction. But what they all do, because they're good engineers, is they have some understanding of what's underneath them and that helps them do a better job at their current level. There's a really great question in the chat, Evan, and they're asking, how did you manage to keep the cost down on the Pico so much? Like, how is it so cheap for what it is? Well, it's tiny. I mean, it really is tiny. The um, If you were to, um, in fact, it's so tiny, somebody did a beautiful set of x-rays um, of the Pico and the chip packages, you can't even really see the die. So you've got that black square in the middle of the board. That's the package. But the chip itself, and that's, uh, off the top of my head, I think it's a 7 by 7 millimeter package. But the die that's inside that is barely more than one millimeter on a side. It's, it's 1.4 mil on a side, so it's two square millimeters of silicon just hiding right down in the middle of that massive hulking package there. Um, so and what that means is when you make silicon, when you make chips, you make them on a wafer. And a wafer is kind of the size of an LP, right? It's about 30 centimeters, 12 inches across. Um, and you can fit 20,000 um, uh, um, RP2040 die into one of those wafers. So even though a wafer is quite an expensive thing to make, take that expense and divide it by 20,000, and that tells you how much wow. silicon is in each of these things. You've then got to put it in a box. You've, you've got to buy the package. You've got to put the silicon in the package. You then, after you've done that, you've got to test the silicon. To, to You've got to test the finished goods in order to make sure that they work properly, and some of them won't. You throw those away, and then you have to you have to charge enough for the for the for the ones that work to cover the cost of the ones that didn't. Um, but even so, you know, the economics are, the economics are very good. And, you know, we were able to get the thing out for $4, which is, um, which is it's amazing, right? It was the cheapest thing we've ever made. We, with Raspberry Pi 400, the Raspberry Pi 400 kit that we did before Christmas at $100 for, the, for a complete PC, that's the most expensive thing we've ever done. And it was kind of cool to follow that immediately with the very, very cheapest thing ever. extreme. Oh. Cost, you know? Yeah, and folks actually, uh, sus subscribers to the Hackspace magazine are actually getting this for free, which yeah. is really neat. It's coming out with the newest issue. Can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about what is Hackspace and why everyone should, should subscribe? Yeah, our Hackspace magazine is our so Magpie magazine was the was the first magazine we did at Raspberry Pi. It's a magazine about. Um, uh, Hackspace was kind of our attempt to um, to kind of broaden out our, the audience because, of course, you know we have this big focus on computing and digital making, um, and so really we wanted to make something that spoke to the entire maker community, not just people who are interested in computers, not just people who are interested in our computer. And that's so that's what Hackspace is. We've been running it for about three years now. Very, it's been very popular, very successful. Like all of our magazines, you can download a free copy um, as a PDF on what. Every every issue, the day it comes out, you can get it for free, uh, or you can buy a physical copy at the newsstand in the UK and North America, or you can subscribe to it. One thing we've always liked to do when we launched Raspberry Pi Zero, we put a free Raspberry Pi Zero on the front. I still remember we ran this wonderful social campaign um, the, the the week before where we at the top it says free, the banner at the top says free Raspberry Pi. Um, and what we did was we did a thing where it was in brown paper. It was just a series of images that got tweeted, but it was wrapped in brown paper and then tearing the corner off. And it said free. And people, first of all, it was just brown paper. Next time, free. <laughs> yeah. free Raspberry Pi. And people were like, oh, I wonder what a free Raspberry Pi um, sticker, a free Raspberry Pi beer mat. And then the last day, it was just torn off and there's nothing after the word Raspberry Pi in the banner. Um, so we, and that was amazing. And there were people besieging um, <laughs> in the UK and the, all the news agents have like, handwritten signs saying, "Don't we don't have any more magpies?" Stop asking. I remember, yeah, uh, and that was amazing. And there was no way we weren't going to do that again. Obviously, it's a slightly weird time because not all news agents are open. It's not necessarily we don't necessarily want to encourage you all to go out and get 
you know, um, uh, to put yourself at risk in order to get your Pico. It's a great product, not really worth the risk. Uh, but if you happen to be somewhere, and news agents are essential businesses in the UK, um, if you happen to be somewhere uh, doing, your, doing, your, doing your essential shop, absolutely pick up a copy of Hackspace, mm -hmm. get your Pico, or subscribe. I should say that. I love getting my copy every month. I love getting Hackspace come through my letterbox every month. It's just like one of those things. It's one really wonderful thing, actually, we've done recently is we have these these PDFs. And one thing we've we've never really given people, we often people would mail us and say, look, I, I'm downloading your PDF. I live in a country where I can't get where I can't get Hackspace or it'd be prohibitive for me to get a subscription. Um, uh, I, I, I'm downloading your PDFs and I'm feeling bad about it. Um, uh, what can I do? And so recently we allowed people to make a little contribution towards the, uh, towards the to effectively to buy the, uh, so pay what you want, they can buy, it, buy the PDF. Really, really, really great take up of that. You know, it's, it really is a thing where it's obviously resonating with people. And it's amazing. It's whenever we've done anything at Raspberry Pi, we've been doing this 12 years now. Um, and you kind of throw yourself on the kindness of strangers and you discover that strangers are wonderful, actually. And, and that there are so many good hearted people out there who want to help us do this stuff. Yeah, definitely. No, very cool. Should we crack on and start doing some coding now? I'll just um, yes, I mean, yes. Uh, we keep talking, obviously, and I'll, I'll sort of like code away yeah. in the background. Make sure you catch any of my errors, Evan, just in case I get uh -oh. them going. But, um, <laughs> so we'll move forward, everybody. Just if you want to get the instructions and follow along, you can see them here. They're at rpf.io/pico-go, and this is the new projects that we've put on. Uh, and there are a number of steps. You can see in the menu here. There's a number of steps. The one we're going to be doing is the coolest one, in my opinion, which is controlling an LED with the analogs, because that's the cool thing that the Pico does uh, that other Raspberry Pis haven't done in the past. And you can see here. So we've got this step of the project. There's a bit of a wiring diagram here, uh, and I've got my work my worktop on the side as well, so we can bring my worktop in, and I'll show you my work. Here. You guys are chatting, so you can see that just here. Okay. So okay. I'll crack on with the coding. Um, the first thing you will need, though, everybody, is you'll need to get the Thony IDE if you're going to use it with your Raspberry Pi Pico, uh, and you can get that from thony.org. So it's totally free. You can just download it to your Mac or Windows or Linux machine uh, and run your Raspberry Pi Pico directly off of Thony. We've got the, um, you have to do the little bit with getting the code, but that's all in the project instructions. We won't do that today because it's really boring for you to watch that. So we'll crack on with the coding part. So we can see here's a wiring diagram, everybody. So I'll crack on with the wiring. If you want to, guys want to have a chat, I'll just start wiring away. Yeah. You're going you're to grill me on electronics now, aren't you? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping you're not going to grill me, if I'm honest. <laughs> Definitely. And I was going to tell folks at home, don't worry. I know some of you are saying, like, I'm still waiting for my Pico to arrive. That's totally fine. Remember, this video and all of our past digital making at home videos are on our channel. So, A, subscribe and also go check them out. So, you can be able, you're able to access these anytime after um, this stream. And so, it's, it's super neat, too. I'm just excited, Mr. C, that we've got this new camera station set up. Yeah. Like, what other cool things that we can definitely do. And also, a reminder Mr. C's starting on like step six of the project. So there was a couple steps such as getting funny. So don't worry, like, I don't want you to stress at home. Enjoy the show <laughs> if that's where you are and have fun with us on it. Uh, Mr. C is also showing off because he's showing off that he has the pre-release, a limited edition pre-release uh, <laughs> Raspberry Pi Pico in dark green. Uh, you got to flash it if you got it, right? You got to have it smell. <laughs> Oh wow! I didn't realize that. Nice. Yeah, it's those. Yeah, it, uh, there were a a parcel, a a secret parcel of secret stuff made its way from Pi Towers. What are we calling them? Are we Pi Towers North and your Pi Towers East or something? I think I think your Pi Towers and we're Pi Central. Ah, okay, right. From made its way from Pi Towers to Pi Central, um, uh, back in November, containing some of these little things. Um, and yes, that's the project. That's cool. So, so just, uh, oh, yeah, Mr. C, could you, what are you wiring up right now? Yeah, so at the moment, um, I'm getting these red and black wires here running from the earth and the power rails uh, on my Pi into the side here so that I can access the power and the earth wherever I want them. I just clip into those rails from where I am, makes my life much easier. Uh, and then what I'm going to do now is I've got a resistor coming off the end of the Pico, just here on the last pin, and I'm going to run that through an LED, okay, and I'm making sure that my LED is in the right holes and that it is straddling the spine in the middle. Or the mm -hmm. What do you call the gap in the middle, Eben? What's your name for it? Every, everyone who comes on, I ask them, mine is the spine. I don't know what you call it. Spine? Yeah. Void. The void. Nice. I've heard the gap. I like void. I like void. The void. Yes, there the right. channel. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard yeah, yeah. Okay. Say, yes. uh, say in, a, in a mysterious voice. Yeah. The voice. Movie trailer man voice. 
For sure. And so I think you just mentioned resistor for so fo folks who are new to physical computing. Eben, would you be able to like, why did you even need a resistor when you're doing this type of project? So um, so you have so what you've got there is a, is a light emitting diode. Um, and what you want to do is you want to avoid shoving too much current through it. Otherwise, it will get hot and burn out because um, there's nothing really intrinsic to the LED that's going to that's going to slow down. So, you know, if you imagine um, you know, LEDs seem a lot like light bulbs. Right, that they're not, as we're going to discover in a moment, they're not in in lots of critical ways. They're not like light bulbs. Um, they they have they have very little resistance when uh, when they're forward biased. So they only light up. Okay, interesting thing about them: light bulb lights up regardless of which way around you connect it. This one's only going to light up when it's forward biased, when there's current flowing through it. Diodes. What is a diode? A diode is a thing that only lets electricity flow through it in one direction. A light emitting diode only lights up when electricity is thrown through it. But when it's forward, when it's reverse biased, it has a lot of resistance. It's really going to stop electricity going through it. Um, when it's forward biased, it's got almost no resistance at all. Um, and so that means if you just connect it across a battery, enormous amounts of current are going to shoot through it. It's going to get hot, um, and then it's going to burn out. Um, and so what that resistor there is do is just slow down the, you know, it's just slow down the, uh, the, 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 the current a little bit, um, uh, and you'll end up in a, you end up in a situation where the, the, the diode has one diode drops worth of voltage across it, and the rest of the voltage is across the, um, is across the, um, the resistor, and we know from Ohm's law um, what the, um, what, what the current's going to be, and we can therefore, if we pick our value of our resistor properly, we can ensure that um, we limit the, the current to something that the LED can handle. So that's one way in which it's not like a, so I think, okay, we've had two ways it's not like a light bulb. One, it only works if you uh, bias it one way. Um, two, unlike a light bulb, which has quite a lot of resistance inside the filament, it doesn't have very much resistance when it's forward biased and therefore it can burn out easily. And we're about to discover kind of, I guess probably, should we lead into the sort of third way it's not like a light bulb? Yes. Which is, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> don't fade it the way you fade a light. You know, you, you know how to fade a, a light bulb, right? You put less voltage across it. Right? Um, that doesn't work. It's either on or it's off. Mm -hmm. it's with, to a first approximation, your LED is either on or it's off. And so if you want to um, have an LED which is at 50% brightness, you're going to have to think of something else to do. And that's what this project is about. Nice. Yeah, and just a reminder to folks, they can check out this project at rpf.io forward slash pico dash go. All right, looking good. Okay. Now, what's that? I see a red LED, and also points to Evan for no for being able just to call out what LED stands for. I don't know if I could just do that on the spot. That's a, so that's a massive LED. <laughs> yeah, I love the big ones. Like, well, the huge LEDs. Now, what's I've the blue thing? Range. I've got like two mule LEDs, they're really tiny, like super bright ones, all the way up to the big chunk of fat ones. For the camera, I found the big chunky fat ones are the best, so I love getting them. Nice work. Now, what's the, I, there, I see the red LED, what's the blue thing? Yeah, the blue thing is a potentiometer. So it's kind of like if you have a dimmer switch on your light bulbs at home, um, it's that, right? So oh, it, sort of works, it, it, it changes the resistance in the circuit. So what we've got the Pico doing basically, correct me if I'm wrong, Evan, is detecting the power coming through the potentiometer. And as I twist it, that variable resistance, the resistance goes up and down. And so as that changes, the Pico reads that change and then can change the voltage to my light bulb. Oh, and what's the name of that again? Sorry, Don, Evan, what were you going to say? Oh, variable, right. resistor, variable resistor. Um, so this is something where, you know, what you're going to do is you're going to have, if you imagine um, uh, a potential it's a potential divider. Suppose I have a rail which is at um, 5 volts, and I have a rail which is at 0 volts, right? And I put two equal-sized resistors. I have resistor, resistor, in series down there. Now, what voltage am I going to be at in the middle? Well, we're going to be at two and a half volts. If they're equal size resistors, you're going to be at two and a half volts. And what this thing does here is this lets you basically adjust those two resistors. And if you adjust it all the way so that the top resistor is very small and the bottom resistor is big, then, well, it's basically connected to five volts. And if you do it the other way around, or it's basically connected to zero volts. And you can kind of sort of convince yourself if you know that it's five there and zero there and two and a half there, then as you make that linear adjustment to between the two resistors, um, and you, in fact, what this, these things physically look like is you have a track of some resistive material, 
which is one end of which is connected to zero, one that is five. And then you have a pointer, basically, you have a contact. And as you twist it, that contact, it's a circular track, and that contact moves around. And so some more of the resistance is on the five volt end or more is on the zero end. And what that lets you do is it lets you give, uh, now you've connected the top end to three to three, I hope, because they're not five volt tolerant pad. Um, you've connected the top end to three V three. And so as you turn that, the, a voltage will appear, which is somewhere in the range naught to max which for you is 3v3. Okay, cool. Yeah, and Evan, you actually just mentioned, I like have a couple of questions. You mentioned like the GPIO numbers, like the 3v3 like or like, why aren't they sequential? Oh, um, why aren't they sequential around the board? Mm -hmm. um, there are gaps, okay, well down the left-hand side, they are fairly, if you look at it with the logo, the logo, down the left-hand side, they are fairly sequential. So they start with GPIO zero and they, um, they start with GPIO zero, they go down that side, and then they kind of go around the corner and then they come back up and they're a sequential, and then they get a bit gappy uh, mm -hmm. on the right side. They do have gaps in them, they have regular gaps in because we have ground pads. So what we have is we have zero volts from time to time. That's really good if you want to do very high speed work. What you want to do is you don't want to have all of your, if you have a lot of high speed signals, you don't want them coming out of GPIOs and then they all have to go back in, ooh, in through one ground pad. You want them to be able to go back in through a ground pad, which is near. Ah, there mm -hmm. we are. In fact, when you look, yeah. when you look at your, what you'll see is that the there are some of the pads are square. So some of them have rounded. Most of them have little rounded insides, but some of them have squared off. Uh, the pad, the gold bit, is squared off, and the squared off is the way we say ground. And there you are. You see them, and they're labelled in black here. Mm -hmm. So ground, and there you have two GPOs, a ground, four GPOs, ground, four GPOs, ground, four ground, two, um, and. So those numbers are fairly continuous. They're fairly continuous at the right-hand side. And then things just get a bit choppy further up. And that's because what we, we have 30 GPIOs. Um, and what we're doing is we use a few of them for our internal functions on the board. So for example, there's an LED on the board. And we use one of our GPIOs to control that LED. Um, there's a uh, there's provision for connecting a battery. And so we use one actually use one of the four analog inputs. We only expose three analog inputs from Pico. There are four analog inputs on the chip. And we use the spare one to monitor the battery voltage. So if you've connected a battery to this, you can monitor the charge state of your battery by um, using that, that fourth hidden um, uh, ADC. Nice. Thank you for that answer. I really, really appreciate it. Well, this is a James Adams product. Like a lot of our products, this is a James Adams product, and it just has that eerie James Adams Bauhaus um, uh, kind of attention to detail thing. Uh, the more you look at it, the more you'll love it. Yes. I mean, I'm falling in love with the Pika right now. And folks, again, are super excited. And also have to give a shout out to Rambling Geek UK on Twitch. Just subscribe. So thank you so much for subscribing to our channel. Really appreciate it. So Mr. C, tell us what's up. How, let's do some coding. Yeah, cool. I'm just um, clicking away now on Thonny. So you can see here I've got my Thonny IBE. Um, and so I'm just going to bring in my modules that I need to make the code go. So from machine, import ADC and pin. So ADC being analog digital converter. Uh, and then pins being the pins on my Pico. So this is sort of like bringing in my modules. So for those watching at home, it's kind of like um, I'm going to throw some instructions at the computer that require these modules. If you don't go and bring them into my script, you won't understand what I'm talking about. So I'm telling it to do that. I'm also going to bring in time because time is super useful for what we're about to do. I want to be able to wait for a second uh, before it does anything else. So I need to bring in time and I'm going to set up my variable for the ABC. Okay, close that again before I forget. And then I lose. So this is, so this is uh, picking pin 26, which is I think the one that you that you decided you were going to use. Um, exactly, for reading yeah. the value. Uh, and it's making uh, an ADC around that isn't it it's saying we are going to use this pin because you could use it as a digital input or a digital output but what you're saying here is we're going to take that pin it's one of the four special pins on the chip that can be used in this way and we're going to use it to get analog values ah. sure. oh evan could you explain what's an adc Okay, so an ADC is an analog to digital converter. So when we when I was talking about voltages, which can vary, right back at the start, I was talking about digital logic, right? Um, ones and zeros, and ones and zeros are expressed by either no voltage, zero, or lots of voltage. Um, and that's all there is, right? There, there aren't intermediate values. The intermediate values are not meaningful. The, the low ones tend to be zeros and the high ones tend to be ones, but there's a sort of no man's land in the middle you're not supposed to go to. Um, uh, but... In this analog world where I'm sweeping a pointer across a resistive track in order to generate a continuously varying voltage between zero and some number, um, that's an analog voltage. Um, and so what I need is a, but if I'm going to work on it in a program, programs deal in numbers, they deal in 
digital values. And so what I need is I need an analog to digital converter, which will take an analog voltage and turn it into a number, um, which I can then work on in the program. Uh, that's what that's what's going on here. Neat. Thank you. And I love this so much. I think it's really neat. And like we said at the beginning, this is an intro to Pico. So it's really about helping folks who are brand new, not just just to the Pico, but to digital making to really get a chance to understand what is happening here. What's what's the code? What are we actually doing? So it's so exciting to have you here, Evan, to explain this stuff and really like talk to us. Like we mentioned earlier, just like for a 10 year old who's watching. For someone like they can see this and be really excited and like, wow, I, I can try this at home. How's it going, Mr. C? It's cool. It's pretty much done now, I think. Um, so just looking through it, I've added a few extra bits. So I've changed, I've made a variable for PWM and that's reading off of pin 15. Um, and so what I've got there is my, I've got my PWM frequency at a thousand just here. And so we can see underneath that my wild true loop is checking for duty. So it sets duty to be the read on my, um, ADC, so it's what is it reading, and then it sends that out through the PWM as that voltage goes to my uh, light bulb. So it's reading what is coming through the resistance, and it's converting that and sending that out to my light bulb to change the brightness on the LED as I change the potentiometer. Um, and so what I need to do now is I'm just going to push the code to the PICO. So I just need to file and save my code to the PICO. So let's see. Nice. And what's really great too, I think you'll see here, um, for, especially if educators are watching, Thani is a really great tool to use, <laughs> like just for kids, for educators who are new to coding. You see at the bottom, like the notes that are just like giving you the information you need, especially if you have any errors in your code, which is why I always will recommend it to folks. And it's automatically on like the Raspberry Pi as well. It's one of the things we're proudest of um, uh, at Raspberry Pi is that we've been able to help uh, Ivar. Um, who, uh, who developed, um, now I'm going to get the wrong Baltic Republic. I think he is in Stonewall. I'm <laughs> going to feel bad because I got the wrong Baltic Republic. Um, but he's been working on, you know, uh, Thony was his kind of personal kind of passion project. Um, and what we've been able to do is we, we've been able to make contributions, both to make it run better on the big Raspberry Pi, and now to make it work better with the small Raspberry Pi. He's an amazing guy. Well, one of those really kind of driven people. Shout out. <laughs> yeah, amazing guy. Okay, so I've got mine hooked up now. So this isn't connected to anything but a battery pack. So I've got one of those little oh, battery packs. Okay, so it's not running off my computer. I'm not running the code on my laptop or anything else. I've flashed it straight to the Pico. The Pico has now stored it internally. Wearing a T-shirt, so you have nothing up your sleeve. Yeah, yeah, see, that's exactly it. No magic there, no, no cables. Massive stack of bracelets there. But, uh, so. And then nice. dim my light bulb. Oh, uh, wow. Ah. See, there you are. Yeah, nice. and, and that's really, that's, there's a lot going on, right, in order to make that happen, right? You know, there's, there's, so the, the interesting thing. So we said LEDs aren't like light bulbs. Now, if you had, if someone gave you a light bulb and a potentiometer and a battery, you could probably figure out how to, you know, arrange it to all. Oh, as I turn it, I get less voltage on the light bulb and the light bulb has, you know, gets dimmer. Um, that's not how LEDs work. They're either on or off. So let's think about how we would dim an LED. Well, what makes them an LED? Suppose imagine you have an LED which is only on for half the time, and then it's off, and it's on, and it's off. In a lot of ways, that's a half. That's an LED that's a half brightness, right? Your eye is going to see because you have persistence of vision in your eye. Your eye is going to see that, even though it's never half on. It's either on or off. Um, your eye will see it as being at fifty percent intensity. If you have a an LED which is on ninety percent of the time and off 10% of the time. Well, that's going to seem like it's almost as bright as an LED that's on all the time. And an LED which is only on 1% of the time, and then off 90, 99% of the time, that's going to seem almost, it's almost off. So you again, just as we sort of talked about the potentiometer kind of sweeping backwards and forwards and having some sort of, um, sort of, sort of analog position. So the amount of time that you turn the LED on for. Now, obviously, if, you're, if you do this... Um, uh, you turn it on, I suppose you want it to be on for a tenth of the time. You want it to be a tenth brightness. And so you turn it on for a second, and you turn it off for nine seconds. That isn't going to look like it's because your your eyes are better than that. Your eyes are terrible. Human eyes are terrible. <laughs> um, but um, it's not going to look right. But if you do it fast enough, you know, if like, you know, faster than cinema film plays back, you know, many times a second, um, then it's going to start to look good. So, you, so if you look at your program, um, one of the first things you did after you made a PWM object that wrapped around that pin, you, could, you set its frequency to a thousand, which I'm going to guess um, means that it's um, running at uh, a kilohertz. 
Yeah. Um, so effectively, a thousand times a second. Imagine a window of a, th a thousandth of a second. That's a millisecond, right? And what you're going to do is you're going to take a millisecond, you know, chop that millisecond up into two periods, one of which is the bit of time when it's on, and the other is the bit of time it's off. And then the next millisecond, you'll do the same thing again. You'll do, 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 keep doing that. And that's what the program does. It goes to the, it reads a, a duty, and we call that the duty cycle. The fraction of the millisecond that it's on for is the duty cycle. So if that's on all the time, 100% duty cycle. Off all the time, 0% duty cycle. On half the time, 50% duty cycle. So what this thing is doing is it's going to the ADC, it's reading a value, which is assigned to a variable called duty, um, and then it's taking that duty and it's poking it straight into the PWM. So it's saying if the, if the ADC is at half, is at 50%, then you want a duty cycle of 50%. If the ADC was at 10%, you want a duty cycle of 10%. And that's all it does. You know, all of that, I mean, you know, thought about abstraction, right? You know, all of the logic gates are whacking up and down in there. You know, we've got something like 12 million-ish, most of it in memory. It's about 12 million transistors inside that. Raspberry Pi Pico, and that two square millimeters, about 12 million transistors. It's a thousandth of actually what's inside Apple's new chip. Apple's new chip's got 12 billion transistors in it. So it's got 12 billion transistors, still a lot by our standards. Um, and oil whacking up and down, you know, doing things. And at the end, what you get, though, is something quite understandable. How far around the, 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 the you know, how far around the dial is the pot? Okay, let's make that fraction of every millisecond on. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's the thing. it's crazy. It's like, sorry, go on, Christina. I think we're both just like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So neat. I just, I, I'm curious. I, we're, we're um, almost running out of time, but Evan, I want to ask, like, so we always talk about, I think, from like Pi Academy, just to when we introduce folks, it's like it starts with an LED, right? And that's what this project is: is introducing the Pico, getting started with an LED. What are some like, what are cool things that you imagine people will, will be building with the Raspberry Pi Pico in the future? Well, I think the, the the home security thing is 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 already quite a long way along the list of things. Yeah. Um, if you think about what I've seen people doing with it, of course, we've had Raspberry Pi uh, Picos out with people for quite a while, and so we've so some people who've had access to these for a little longer have had a chance to do really cool stuff. Um, one um, a really amazing thing. So Graham Sanderson's a very old friend of mine uh, out, out in Austin in Texas. Um, he has done a BBC micro emulator. So the weird thing about this, I talked 40 years ago, right? BBC Micro, 399 pounds. So that's 1,200 pounds in today's money, um, thanks to the magic of inflation. Um, and he has been able to emulate the entire behavior of that 1,200 pound, what now be a 1,200 pound object on his PK. Uh, and you can plug it, into a, plug it into a VGA monitor and he can play Elite or Exile or any of those good old BBC Micro games, or he can use a BBC, he can use it as a computer, right? You know, we said this isn't a computer. The very first thing I said was this isn't a computer, this is a controller. But in fact, it's such a powerful controller that it can emulate a computer. And so <laughs> you want to, I mean, if you want to do word processing, the thing's got a USB connection, you plug a USB keyboard into it. If you want to write, do some word processing, a thing you could do is to run Graham's BBC Micro Emulator and run WordWise Plus, which was the word processor I used to use when I was a child to do my homework, um, on your Raspberry Pi Pico. Amazing. Oh, wow. It was, right? It's, in, it's just... Do you just, think someone could have imagined that 40 years ago? Thinking, uh, like, oh, this is eventually going to be on something for $4. So I actually, I can't do the conversion. I don't know what that is. <laughs> 40 years ago, like the cost of that. But, yeah, right. Um, it, it's a... It, well, well, of course. I mean, famously, um, a Gordon Moore did. Um, so we have this thing called Moore's Law, which is this idea that uh, well, Gordon Moore put forward, who's one of the founders of Intel, put forward in the late 60s, early 70s, saying that the number of transistors that you were talking about, how many transistors you fit into a chip, into a given area of silicon, would seem to be doubling every year or two. Um, and so he said, you know, he said, that's incredible because doubling every year or two doesn't sound much. But you know the story about the, the, the knight who does some service to the king uh, and, and the king says, what do you want? He says, well, okay, give me a chessboard. I want one piece of rice on the first square and two on the second and four on the next. And, you know, by the time you get several rows down the chessboard, that's all the rice in the kingdom. Um, you know, the power of exponential doubling is enormous. Uh, and so actually, I mean, probably it's it's kind of, it would be a stretch to imagine that he saw it going all the way to today. But we have lived our lives in, 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 in 
light the night with the chessboard, you know, with endless just supply of processing power thrown at our heads. Um, and that either turns into more processing, remember that, either turns into more processing power at a given price, or it turns into less price for a given amount of processing power. And kind of if you see what Raspberry Pi has done, uh, what we did when we launched, what we were really saying was PC vendors have been using it the one way. They've been saying it's a thousand bucks. Let's fill a thousand bucks with as much processing as we can every year. And really what Raspberry Pi, our insight has, was to say, can we take the amount of processing power that we had 10 years ago? How much would that cost now? Oh, Oh, it costs $35. Um, and then, well, of course, what we've done then is the same thing the PC vendors do, which is to take $35 and fill every year, fill $35 up. So, you know, Raspberry Pi 4, eight years after Raspberry Pi 1, is 40 times as powerful at $35. Um, and that's why we do things like Zero, and it's why we do things like Pico, to remind ourselves that we don't want to be like PC vendors were. Right? We don't want to we, – we always want to, every now and then – take a given amount of performance and use Moore's law the other way to, to, to drive the cost down. And Pico, kind of looking back over that 40-year window to emulating BBC Micro, is kind of the, the, the most insane logical conclusion of that way of thinking. Wow. So, oh, go ahead, Mr. I, I think just wow, right? And just to think yeah, where like, we come and where we're going to go. It's end. Just, it's just incredible. Um, it's just, and it's coming to an end. This yes, thing yeah. that, we, that we have lived in the that we've we've lived through is coming to an end. You know, it's coming to an end because we're running out of atoms. You know, when you look at that five nanometer chip, the uh, Apple M1, um, the, the the structures a five nanometer structure is about thirty silicon atoms across. You can't make it a thirtieth. It's not going to work if it's one silicon atom across. Yeah. So, so finally, you're approaching physical limits. Now there may be other things that take over from CMOS um, as the way that as the way that we build. Um, computer systems, but that era of the steady drumbeat of CMOS process nodes going down, that, that's very nearly done, and it's very nearly done because we're going to run out of atoms. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh statistical emphasis. The whole thing's statistical. You know, it's all about, oh, this fraction of atoms have been replaced, where silicon atoms have been replaced by dopant. That makes sense when there are a thousand atoms. You can say, oh, 10 of them, you know, you know 10 of them are probably on average about 10 of them are dopants. Once you're down to 10, it's, it's, what well, once, once you're down to 10, it's like it's not, you can't have a hundredth of the atoms because there are only 10 atoms. <laughs> oh, yeah. Evan, Evan we, could, we could have a whole nother episode talking about atoms totally. and geeking out about where we're going to next. But I, we, we're out of time, but this has been absolutely incredible. Thank you for coming on again with so much, being yeah. at home. Like, I really appreciate it. See you guys because so we good don't, to see you. It's, I haven't seen you in so long. I haven't seen you since this, right? I'm wearing my oh. USA from the first week of March last year when we were all like, hey, I wonder if this thing's going to be a thing. Right. Um, so I really miss you guys. I'm really looking forward to seeing you in person. Really miss you. And thanks for wearing the Coolest Projects shirt. Folks, stay tuned. News about Coolest Projects is coming up. Yeah, We're yeah. really excited. We'll be sharing on Digital Making at Home. Keep, like, keep an eye on this space. Go follow Coolest Projects on Twitter. And check out the yeah. website. It's an awesome um, program. And maybe, kids, you can maybe create a project with uh, P the Pico. It would be pretty cool to check out with Raspberry Pi Pico. Well, Evan, thank you so much. It's been incredible. Hopefully, we'll see you soon. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Later, boss. Amazing. So cool. My mind's blown. <laughs> like, um, also, Evan just knows so much. Yeah. Right? Like, that's I, I can't wait till we can all be together again and just to sit story time with Evan <laughs> and hear just like hear so much because just to be able to reference in the knowledge that he has about computers from 40 years ago to now, it's absolutely incredible. And I think it's it's really a big part of why what we're able to do with Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi Foundation, which is just so amazing. Absolutely. The whole thing about exploiting Moore's law to keep a price point, but make the technology more powerful. Like that is one of my favorite things about what we do. I think that's just so clever, so incisive and a great way to get people started in computing, right? Make it easy for them to access. You know, you don't need all the power in the world. I think that's so cool. And like being able to program a little board like Pico for embedding using Thony, so easy, like you saw today. It means I can make so much cool stuff. I'm going to try my hand at that security project, I think.
Yes, right. And I have to let my dad know because he's always he's really into microcontrollers and that wasn't something what we had. So now I can be like, hey, buddy, check this out. And it was also so great to see so many of you in the chat this week. Shout out to Sarong. Um, for like, and we've got Ali. Hello again, Alex. Um, it's so great to see so many of you for all your great contributions to the discussion. Thank you to everyone. We had folks from all over the world today and it was incredible to chat with you. Also, thank you to our colleague, Mr. Uh, Mark Scott, who's been in the chat taking your technical questions. If you didn't get your question answered, there's also tons of really high quality technical documentation available at rpf.io. Um, slash pico dash docs. You can check out that link up here on the screen. And if you still have a question, need a question answered, check out the Raspberry Pi forum. So that's all we have time for this week. You can always get in touch with us though. Send us an email at dmah at raspberrypi.org right there. We love to hear from you. If you have something you wanna share with us, you can also tweet a picture of it to us at raspberrypi underscore, or at raspberrypi, which you can tweet at raspberrypi <laughs> underscore pi. <laughs> so, and, and we love getting the pictures that come in, guys. Send them to us. And don't forget to make sure to subscribe on YouTube, rpf.io slash sub, or just hit the button on YouTube and Twitch. It's literally right there and you'll be the first to know when we go live. You'll get updates on all the other good content on the channel, things about Coolest Projects, AstroPi, all that stuff. As I mentioned before, this is our new channel, okay? So this focuses on kids and educational work we do, and there's going to be a lot more educational content, things for you to do at home coming up soon. Thank you all for being here for the Raspberry Pi Foundation's Digital Making at Home live stream again this week. We'll be back at the same time next week, once again, with more digital making. Until then, stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you next time. Catch you later, Christina. See you later. Bye.